Please go along with the responsive reading. This house is a sanctuary. This house is a harbinger of freedom. May our strength rise up out of wisdom and be the guided humbly by great story, festival, and practice. During May of 2014, I sat in the sanctuary at Fountain Street Church with many excited graduates to receive my diploma from Kendall College of Art and Design. Here I am standing in front of you today in that very same sanctuary over a year later. My journey started with sanctuary yoga with Dana Christian Lee. I am so thankful to know someone so amazing. That summer I began attending Embody GR, which is a yoga class that meets here at Fountain Street on Wednesday nights. At Embody GR, I made friends with all ages and faiths. I never would have guessed that I would make friends older than my parents, many of whom attend Fountain Street Church. I'm so thankful to my friends here who accept me for who I am and where I am at in life, despite our large age gaps. It doesn't matter if you're irreverent or pious, straight or gay, black or white at Fountain Street, as soon as you come into the door, you are accepted. I think that is what makes me always come back, acceptance. I have been accepted despite my age, gender, religion, and political views. It has opened a dialogue between my boyfriend and I, an agnostic and a believer. It has made us closer and come to realize that we are both free thinkers. Fountain Street Church has also let me be able to ask more intense questions about my faith that my conservative family could no longer understand. Chanting and playing kirtan, a Hindu tradition, doesn't get much praise in West Michigan. As much as we can love our families, we can't choose our biological families. Instead, we can choose our church families and friends. I think that's what I've learned during my year here, that you can choose the path you want to go on, that you don't have to give in to other people's expectations, but you can create your own, and that being true to yourself will make you happier than being who others want you to be. I'm so thankful for Fountain Street Church and for my friends here. I've received so much support as I learned to be who I truly am. So I welcome you to Fountain Street Church, where you can free the mind, grow the soul, and change the world. Thank you.
Thank you.
one of my all-time favorite pieces of music, regardless of translation or no translation. I love it. Also, I suppose a uh, good place to do a shameless plug for our November 1st uh, concert coming up here at 4 o'clock, featuring this wonderful choir, a number of other choirs and choruses, and also happens to be a benefit for our Heartside Ministry. So 4 o'clock, November 1st, put it on your calendars. You won't want to miss it. You will want to be here and bring your friends and their checkbooks and their cash. See, we can do that too. Uh, I want to thank uh, Fountain Street Church for your support of Heartside Ministry over the years. So we tend to, like you, engage in some of the more challenging social issues of our day, like hosting the needle exchange of the Grand Rapids Red Project. Amen. <laughs> also being one of the few uh, Ministries and agencies working with the homeless in Grand Rapids who are fully welcoming of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender neighbors. Also want to thank you for just simply this invitation to be here. And I want to thank so many of you here who have been and continue to be my teachers and mentors throughout, uh, throughout my life. Thank you. I bring you greetings from the Heartside Ministry Chapel that is just beginning its worship service right now. And I offer uh, these words, uh, not of scripture, oddly, given how prolific religious art is, it is hard to find religious scripture about art. I suppose in the beginning, God created. So hear these instead. From James Baldwin. You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world. But then you read. It was Dostoevsky and Dickens who taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. Only if we face these open wounds in ourselves can we understand them in other people. An artist is a sort of emotional or spiritual historian. His role is to make you realize the doom and glory of knowing who you are and what you are. She has to tell, because nobody else can tell, what it is like to be alive. From Christian uh, mystic of the Middle Ages, Meister Eckhart, what does God do all day long? God lays in a maternity bed, giving birth. God lays in a maternity bed, giving birth. From Rosa Parks, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. I would like to be remembered as a person who wanted to be free, so other people would also be free. And finally, from Pablo Picasso, of all people, art is a lie that makes us realize the truth. We have art so we don't die. That's literally true at Heartside Ministry, by the way. We have art so we don't die. People are alive because they can come in and do art and be more fully alive. So a month ago or so now, I said uh, to my friend Rob Kirkbride, who is a member of this congregation, said, uh, hey, let's uh, meet up this coming Wednesday at the Stand for Marriage Equality, as we've done for many months and many years. And Rob said, there's no need. <laughs> right, right, of course, marriage equality is now the law of the land, right? Is there an amen in here? Not people out there somewhere? Where did we stand, though, for that stand for marriage equality? Under the statue of Rosa Parks. Of Rosa Parks standing, the woman who refused to stand on the bus and give up her seat to a white man. Of Rosa Parks, who in addition to the quotes earlier said, from my upbringing and the Bible, I learned people should stand up for rights, just as the children of Israel stood up to the Pharaoh. We stood up to the Pharaoh under a statue. 
We stood up to the Pharaoh under a piece of public art. We stood up to the Pharaoh under art to change the world, and change the world it did. Questions that I ask today, standing in what has for many years been one of Art Prize's finest venues, and certainly the most powerful venue for social change, is this. How do we ensure that the art exhibited here for these 17 days of Art Prize makes a difference all year round? How can we be sure to keep listening to the marginalized, those with marginal eyes? who see and feel the real impacts of our world in their very beings and their very bodies? Is there a way the art in our homes can change the world? How can we ensure that our public art continues to change the world? And before I delve into those questions, let me be clear about this. Not all art has to be specifically about justice, or at least not about changing the world. For justice, at its core, and at its definition, is about right relationships. And in that sense, all art is about justice. Art helps us see truths more clearly. Art brings us into deeper relationships with reality. We see things more fully. We are attracted to beauty. We are called to be more beautiful ourselves. We are inspired to make our world more beautiful. Art as beauty has as much of a role in art as justice as does art as social commentary. And what we are talking about today is art that is both beautiful and social commentary. As a segue into telling you about the art and artists of Heartside Ministry and letting you hear about life through their own words, which if you're not uh, aware of where we're located, we're just three and a half blocks south on Division here. So right out to Division, three and a half blocks south on the same side of the road here, the east side of the road. I offer this quote from our previously cited mayor and my predecessor at Hartside, uh, Mayor Hartwell, who said, art provides a pathway into a realm where truth becomes clarified, where beauty takes new dimension and where the creator and the observer enter a sacred space and see each other and the world in which they live in a new way. So I invite us today to come on down to Heartside and take a look into our world in a new way. I want to start by introducing you to a man named Magic. He also goes by the names Anthony and loyal T, loyal with a T, loyalty. Magic is one of the most amazing people I know. He is a bundle of energy, he is quick-witted, he is exceedingly deep and multi-talented. Magic made his introduction to me in two ways when I first came to Heartside three and a half years ago. The first was my very first day on the job and they're showing me around the place and Magic asked me if I could show him how I tied my tie. No one had ever asked me this before. And I didn't think that I tied my tie in any special way, so I gave him this quizzical look. He quickly responded, don't worry, man, I'm not going to take your tie. (laughs) Also calling out the implicit racism in our social relationship and in our reality. My second introduction to Magic came by way of his absence a few weeks later. I asked the staff, Where, where's Magic? I haven't seen him around. He's been arrested, they said, and he's in jail. For what? Skateboarding while black. Skateboarding while black. Was it illegal to skateboard in downtown Grand Rapids? Yes. But somehow it was only our neighbors of color who were ever put in jail for it, not the kids from outlying areas who came down with their boards. Recently I ran into Magic again and he'd been working in a packing facility. I was glad in some ways that he had a job. 
However, I saw him just a couple weeks later, and after a month or two on the job, that, one, that job proved too confining. We have very few places in this world for someone who has nothing but raw creative talent, mental health issues, a need to be free, high intelligence, and high energy. The best place that we can often find for such people is prison. Hear magic in his own words. I guess I'll just sleep in this stairwell like a rat. See, where I come from, within the slums of reality, it's crazy the amount of degradation we must endure on a daily basis. This is truth. Even if I were to conform, things would remain the same, only disguised with a mask akin to the one that has been placed upon the face of slavery. They call it work now. Only difference is they give us a lose-lose deal and tell us to make a choice. Part of what that lose-lose deal looks like in Grand Rapids at this very moment is that, if, is that you can remain homeless with all the danger and scraping by that that entails, with the amount of degradation we must endure on a daily basis, or you can work. And at $8 or even $10 an hour, two things are likely to happen. One, you'll be hired as a temp worker and let go the week before you would have been hired in permanently. Or two, you will find that you can't actually survive on 8 to $10 per hour in Grand Rapids and pay for rent, health care, transportation, food, etc. And certainly you can't live up to the promises of what comes across on the myriad of screens that have replaced our son in this world, Matthew Fox would argue. On that subject, Magic writes, there is an insidious message emanating from the TV screen every time I turn it on. I catch the glimpse of it, and if I close my eyes and focus, I can hear the silent shouting, clear as day, nudging and cajoling my subconscious, attempting to infiltrate and persuade me. You should feel like, be like, this is what you need to be thinking. Your life should consist of thinly veiled lies, masking a vast network of confusion, anger, and unhealthy amounts of sorrow and woe. Art telling truth that sometimes we don't see because it is the air we breathe. Magic's companion piece to that one is this. It is always so invasive when it comes silently tiptoeing in the night, footsteps upon its path, light as baby's breath. I have a pot here. I didn't put it up here initially because I don't want it to fall. I think I've already broken a piece of it once before. Uh, this pot is from an artist at Heartside Gallery. Her name is Bertha Ramirez Zamora. And I love this pot. Uh, it's empty. I suppose we could grow something in it or serve some food in it or something like that one of these days. Bertha worked in the fields in Texas while growing up. She's 70 years old this year. She worked in the fields in Texas while growing up as well as in a laundromat. Her parents didn't believe that she was smart enough to go to school. When I was a kid, she says, I had to work a lot for the family. So, that, so now that I am an adult, I play with clay and mud like a kid. She says that sewing and pottery keep her young. I might be an old lady. I've been through enough in my life, but it doesn't mean I have to act like an old lady, she says. Somebody in the earlier service was telling me about one of those days this past winter that was so snow-filled that work and school, many workplaces and schools were closed. And they came around the corner down here at Division in Fulton to see Bertha coming down the middle of the street in her scooter. Bertha cannot be stopped. She is a force of life. 
A few years, years ago, we wrote, uh, we have a, some bio pages on our artists in the studio, and we wrote on Bertha's bio page that she was homeless for a while. But now that she has her own place, she sees no chance of going back. However, two years ago, when her partner of 20 years, Guillermo, was arrested, detained, and deported for not having legal status as an immigrant, though here in the U.S. since his early teens, Bertha did find herself homeless again. Once again, her art, and not only her art, but the community in which we do art, sustained her. I don't want to be sitting down watching TV, Bertha says. I want to do something great before I leave the world. I am defective from my brain, and I know that they say I have a lot of trouble with anxiety. It goes away when I walk and pray, when I occupy my brain with making things by my hands. So you see that she's made this side of the pot, which is kind of the face that many of us have to give to the world and give to those who are in power. But on the other side of the pot, she has placed what makes it my favorite pot, this. So if you're far away and you can't see what's going on here, this, this face has a tongue sticking out of it. Because sometimes that's the face she or others would like to give, but cannot, for fear of punishment or incarceration or otherwise. But it brings out a truth again. It unmasks us again. I think it's going to stay here. Pray for it. That brings me to, to Corey, uh, Corey Ruiz, um, who makes these amazing mask paintings. Uh, he is an artist who has some artwork in the chapel here, along with uh, his new wife, Butterfly, and they've done that with Sean Lancaster and uh, Suzanne Werblow Schmidt and Geraldine Anderson. And Corey wrote this poem. Uh, you have to know, too, that, that Corey uh, was put up for adoption when he was born. He lived in 32 foster homes and twice tried to uh, be adopted. Families tried to adopt him, and neither time did it work out. Corey writes, Before I leave, I put on a mask to hide my feelings. When I talk to people and they ask me how I am doing, I always tell them, I am doing just fine. I am just lying to myself and others because I really don't want anybody to know how I really feel. Over time, Corey writes, he had turned to drugs and to booze to try and kill the pain that he was going through. But that didn't work at all, he says, and I was really lost in my life with nowhere to run or hide. When I came into the studio, it made me feel really warm, like a big family. Like a big family. Powerful words from Corey. His now wife, Butterfly, writes this poem. There is a time and place for everything. Time never stops, it just keeps going on. Every breath is another, second gone. Don't waste your minutes, complaining and dwelling in the darkness all the time. will once chase away the light. People like it when you take your happy pills. Just a suggestion. <laughs> And the final artist I want to share with you is uh, an artist whose name is Scott. Um, Scott started by doing graffiti as a young man growing up here in Grand Rapids. Eventually became, he says, sick of that scene and sick of the threat of incarceration. We were talking in the service earlier this morning about graffiti and you see some graffiti in your uh, program this morning. If it's sanctioned, and if it's a part of Art Prize, or it's paid for by the powers that be, then it's okay. For 
Scott and people like him who don't have access to that level of power, it's not. And so he retreated to his little black book to do his sketches that eventually started coming out in our gallery in whatever he could find on, on pieces of wood, on the back of old skateboards, on pieces of cardboard. And so I brought one piece along of his. Again, I'll test some of your eyes further away. This was uh, his piece that was a part of our uh, art prize entry last year at Heartside called Unchain the Neighborhood. Unchain the Neighborhood. And uh, again, for those who are further away, you can see this figure here and money signs, dollar signs uh, all over, including the sun shining that out and this person's reaction to it. One of the things that we try and do is to get this commentary from the, those who are marginal in our community, who see life differently, and who see how we can change it out into the world. I share these stories not because they're nice, not to make us feel bad or to feel good. I share them today so that we can ask ourselves individually and collectively, how can we ensure that art to change the world isn't just a two and a half week art prize display? How can we make space for the voices and the visions of the marginalized to show us what we can't see about ourselves and about our world, and then to change that world? Another of our artists, Mike Tate, says, without art, I'd be sitting around the house. Artists produce good thoughts, and we can make something magically appear with a pencil. He sums up what we're doing so well. Make something magically appear with a pencil. Gill, another of our artists, says, we are creations with the ability to create whatever our mind can think of. Because of this, we've seen art heal and turn a group of individuals into a family. Art is the very bread of our community. And now to end where I began. I had a conversation just this past week, Thursday, standing outside in front of the ministry with a gentleman named Raymond, and the conversation turned upon black economics in Grand Rapids. And he cited the study that we are one of the worst communities, one of the worst cities for that in the country. And he talked about how there are so few black-owned businesses that he knows of. And he talked about how, you know, he says to them, they gave us that Rosa Parks circle thing, just enough to keep us placated. Just enough crumbs out of that bread that Gil talked about. Just enough crumbs to keep us from rising up. And so I bring Raymond's question to us today. Will we leave our Rosa Parks statues, statue as crumbs to keep us satisfied with just enough? Or will this Rosa Parks statue be art to change the world? Will Rosa Parks be simply another piece of public art, or will it be a piece of public justice? Go in peace, to live fully, to love wastefully, and have the courage to be who we have been made to be. Amen.